Yeah, yeah it's the day there. If anybody wants to um, play with it a little bit, otherwise you're welcome to use your own device, um, any device that you have as well. So my name is Molly Schrader, and I am a technology integration specialist and um, consultant, technology education consultant. Um, I live in Minneapolis, Minnesota, um, but practically live in California this summer. This is my third of five trips out this summer. <laughs> so I feel I consider myself a Californian. I just can't decide where I'd move. I just went to San Diego for ISTE, and I had a really hard time leaving. But I love San Francisco, and I love this area. So um, it's just it's really fun to be with you. Um, I am a former classroom teacher. I used to teach fifth grade, and um, now I'm out of the classroom as a teacher on special assignment, doing technology integration with teachers. My main focus is elementary, just because that was the teacher, that was the field that I was in. Um, but really, with Google Apps for Education, I do our K-12 rollout and professional development. And a little bit about our story with Chromebooks is that we um, started piloting them in March of this year. So we just ordered a couple class sets and we put them in the hands. Um, one to one in one fourth grade classroom in a classroom that had been using Google Apps for Education um, in the lab for their technology setting. And so we just gave them the Chromebooks and then we also did um, two ninth grade classrooms, um, teachers that teach government. So they had um, a variety of kids that were sort of coming through their classroom. And I have just seen a significant transformation in uh, the ways that kids are engaging in their learning, the ways that they are collaborating together and the ways that we can really publish the work that they're doing so that they have an audience unlike that they have ever had before. So I am really excited about the Chromebooks. Um, you are um, sitting in front of the Samsung Chromebook and um, just recently, like, I don't know, Kevin, how long ago did the new one come out? They just shipped, right? About a month ago, the new 5500 came out. Stop by the Google booth. I know a couple of them have them out there. Kevin has one back there. It looks um, it's silver, a um, little bit different looking, but, um, so anyway, so the Chromebooks are just a, a chance for you to experience what um, it would be like to be on the web only. So that's that's what the Chromebook is. The Chromebook, like Jamie was talking about, if the web is our platform, this is the way that you can get on the web. And it really is only the web. And it is the place that students can access their own information. I can give you, I was somebody just came in and she said, oh, I just got over the Golden Gate Bridge and I forgot my Chromebook on my table. And I said, here, have mine, you can use yours. She just logs it, all of her stuff is there. That is not the case with other unnamed devices, correct? <laughs> so um, anyway, so I just want to talk a little bit about how we've used um, Chromebooks in the classroom. But what's really cool about the presentation and everything that I'm going to be saying is you don't have to have a Chromebook in order to do what we're doing. Right? It's all on the web, so you can do it depending on, as long as you can get online, you can do the things that we've been talking about. In my presentation too, I might not only be talking about Google Apps for Education, because when we talk about the classroom and the cloud, we know that there are a lot of other great vendors out there that have products. We all use other Web 2.0 sites and different programs that we love to use too. So when we think about the way that we want students to learn, Google Apps for Education is definitely sort of our Base. It's our home base in which that's the way that students sort of launch the learning in the classroom. So I just want to share a little bit about that. Um, but first of all, how do you get to all the resources? Let me give you a little tour of what will be helpful for you throughout, throughout the rest of the conference. Um, the first one is you should have written down the ca.gafesummit.com. And um, underneath ca.gafesummit.com, okay, these are going to be your little resources. You can always click on the cloud to come back to the home base to get to any of the links. So remember, you can click on the cloud. To find the sessions that you want to attend, you're going to click on program, and you're going to click on detailed sessions. Something that we added last night, too, were these little strands. So if you like feel like you're a teacher that's just getting going, you can click on the getting going hashtag, and it will list all the sessions that the presenters said that they were in the getting going strand. Okay. Same thing goes for gearing up, which is sort of intermediate, geeky, getting geeky, which is geeking out a bit, good for administrators, and then sort of a technical deployment. But also, what you're going to find is on the resources tab was updated to have a spreadsheet of presentation of presenter resources. So this is going to be constantly updated as the presenters keep getting me their information. But if, in case you didn't get to attend somebody else's session, you will be able to find a link to everybody's session here on the resources tab. So you don't have to worry about writing it down or bookmarking it yet because this is going to exist until the rest of time, mm -hmm. until the internet is replaced by the next best thing. 
So we have, um, we have all those resources there for you. My specific presentation that I'm going to do this morning um, is at this short goog.goo.gl URL. Okay, so all you have to do is you just go up to that Omnibar in Chrome. Hopefully you're using that, even if you're not on a Chromebook. If you're on a Chromebook, you're using Chrome. And you don't even have to type in the HTTP. You just have to type goo.gl slash, and it's all case sensitive, so lowercase w, capital H. Anybody know if it's an L or an I? I? That is what? L, okay. thank you very much. Lowercase L, capital X, lowercase C. I would be thrilled if this URL shortener didn't use zeros, O's, yeah. I's, or L's. <laughs> if we could just change the code to exclude those, that would make my life a lot easier. Yeah, exactly. I wish there was somebody I could talk to and Google about that. <laughs> Yeah. So let's talk about um, a classroom in the cloud. The first thing that you're going to need to do is you're going to need to get your head in the clouds. And you're going to need to start thinking about the web as your platform. How many of you have the experience of when you have your computer with you and you have no internet? What is the feeling? Well, I don't know what I'm going to do right now. I have nothing to do on my computer without being on the web. So we ourselves need to be moving to the web. We need to be using Google Docs as the way that we work. We need to be using Google Sites as the way we publish information. So you yourself need to get your head in the clouds so that we can then move our classroom into the clouds. So these are my little fourth graders, and they work. They came to a little show and tell that we had at our public or at our school district. And we were just showing off. And these kids, I could have brought them as our little sales team. These kids could be sitting out there, and they would sell you a Chromebook in under a minute. They love the things. Some of the benefits that they'll tell you is you'll see that this is the easiest lab that we've ever set up at any conference. Why? No cords, <laughs> right? You just flip them on. Anybody can open them and log into their own Google account. Okay. When they are off, it takes eight seconds to boot them up. And if I was going to have you do something really important that you needed to look at me and not be typing on your computer, I could have you close the front. I could have you close screens down. You could open it up, and it's instant on. That does not happen on our other laptops, I'm just telling you. So some of those are the benefits that the kids would tell you, too, is the battery life. We're not going to plug these computers in all day. Okay? They have an eight-hour battery life. So some of those things are the benefits that these kids find really help them to transform the way that they're, they're um, in their classroom. So these are some of the things that we love. The management of the Chromebooks is amazing, too, because the Chromebooks come with the management in your Google Apps for Education dashboard. And if I said that this is my fifth grade class, I could go into the management dashboard and I could set up my fifth graders so that when a fifth grader logs into the Chromebook, they get this website opened up, this Google app or this app is on their um, their new tab page, and I would have them have these three extensions. And then when that fifth grader logs out and a ninth grader logs in, different pages open, different apps and extensions are there. So they're really easy to manage, and you just push it out once. You don't even have to touch the device. That's really nice. Also, any device, anytime. I told you that it doesn't matter who has the device, what what device you have. You log in, and it's by user login that you get all your information. So this is these are those little kiddos, again, showcasing their stuff. So Google's slogan that they're sort of saying is, we're ready when you are. We've got the web up. We've got all these great apps. We've got this way that you can manage it. Get your head in the clouds. Let's do this. So a couple examples of how we are using Google Apps for Education and the Chromebooks and the web in our classroom, I just want to showcase a little bit. The first one is Google Docs. So Google Docs is an online word processing program that you can access anytime and anywhere. But what's unbelievable and sort of magical about it is the fact that you can start collaborating. So instead of you emailing out okay, an attachment to seven people and now having eight copies of something, you now invite an email address to the Google Doc so that everybody's working on one document at the same time. Same thing with class groups and the same thing with, um, with group work that students are working on. And you also have the peer editing. So if a student would share, would, would share that um, Google Doc with you, 
you'll see here that there's now comments and conversations happening on the side of the Google Doc, and that's by inserting a comment on any of the Google Docs. So depending on the sharing settings that you have, you can do some peer editing, collaboration, and then also publication. And that publication is the place where you can, <clears throat> um, uh, we're not gonna watch this actually right now. That's, it's just a little long, but you can watch it at some point when you're, see that, it's just the way, it's just the growth of a Google Doc um, from a student, which is kind of fun, and she, she made the video herself, which is really great too. So, Google Docs also allows you to work, your workflow to become a little bit different as a teacher. Okay? When you are going to be working um, with a group of people, you probably have a distribution list within your email account. Okay? So you're working on your documents, you have all these things, and then you have to go to your email to send out the distribution list and the link. Well, Google Docs, which has now become Google Drive, has now uh, made it so that you can have shared folders. And shared folders allow you to collaborate with other people in sharing settings and email people right from within the folder, okay? So an example that I'm gonna show you real quick is, um, let's see here, I'm not logged into this one. We have a grading and reporting um, committee, right? So we had about 50 teachers that would come together and they were gonna revamp our report card for standards-based <coughs> learning and things. And so this is at a district level that it works really well. But what we did is we said we no longer want um, to email attachments to everybody and we don't want to have to um, have all these copies of all these things and our, our shared space on our server is becoming my project to get rid of because it's at like 89% capacity and we just almost don't have any more space for any of the documents that we're going to be in that shared space. And if we have to do more space in that server, guess what? It costs the district money that we don't have to, to add towards that, okay? So what we have is we have now a folder on Google Drive that's called Grading and Reporting. Every single document that we needed to have for that committee meeting is now in this folder. And the full 50 of us, we only had to enter it one time, which I can also email all the collaborators. So if you think about this being in the classroom too, this, this grading and reporting committee could be your students. So you could email all of your students that are in that folder that you added one time, you shared with them one time at the beginning of the year, and now you can email them from right within Google Docs and Google Drive, okay? So imagine now I'm a teacher, and I have one of these folders over there that's a place, a folder that students have submitted their Google Doc to me. Okay. As a teacher, I can go in and I can open that folder and I can see all the documents along with a preview of each of the documents along the left side. Okay. So the workflow of the way that you can work using Google Docs and Google Drive highly improves your efficiency in the way that you can communicate because you're using just your Google Apps environment for almost everything that, you're, that you do. The sharing and the collaboration of that helps you organize things so that you have a lot more efficiency within there. So with running a paperless classroom, this is exactly what I just showed you. In running a paperless classroom, a lot of teachers are saying, I'm not gonna do any more handouts. And share it in the sharing settings with the teacher so that then the teacher has a paperless classroom and can organize all of their documents into those folders and they can easily access them from any time, anywhere. We use Google Spreadsheets for classroom conferences, field trip signups, lots of different things in that way, collecting behavior, grades, report cards, all those kinds of things. And what we do with the, the spreadsheets is you can have a sharing setting on each of the spreadsheets that allows you to um, have anybody with the link edit the document. <coughs> so if I go into the spreadsheet, I would set up my conferences or my field trips and in the sharing settings up in the top right hand corner, you can see that one of the sharing settings that will come with a Google account, you don't have these, but if your school district has, has adopted Google Apps for Education, you get a few more sharing settings. Yes? That's a good question about subdomains, uh, suborganizations. Correct. Would you create suborganizations? No, you have that big just organization at that point. Yep. <coughs> good question. Good question. 
Google presentation. So these are, re oh, yeah, question more. Um, when somebody goes in and edits the documents, it sends the files to the same version? It does say version. Yes, there is revision history. Yep, exactly. So I had a, an administrator call me the other day saying her entire newsletter was gone. And so we said, well, let's just go into file, see your revision history, and then you could resort back to the previous version. So Google Docs automatically save. You're not going to see a save button. But it not only automatically saves the, the, what you're working on right now, but every prior version. And if you're collaborating with somebody, so if uh, I'm working on this presentation with Sergio, when I go into revision history, Ser Sergio? Sergio. Sergio, his will be in like green, and mine will be in pink. And I'll be able to see what he's put in there, and I'll be able to see what I've put in there. Okay? If you do it the way that I did it with the spreadsheets, though, where anybody can edit, it just shows up as anonymous user one did this, anonymous user number two did that. So it doesn't, unless I specifically share with specific people, it will just record all the different previous versions so that I can always resort back to the other, to the previous versions, but I won't, ex I won't see exactly whose it is. Okay, question. But what we do is for any single subject that you teach, any single grade level, you could choose, you could do with the A to Z project. So if we were going to do the A to Z project on California, let's say that as, you know, we're studying California history, and I assign each student a letter, and I say you have to find something about California history that has to do with that letter, and then you are going to be responsible for that slide that has your letter on it, and I want you to insert a video, I want you to insert a link to a, a good website that, you know, it works with that, and then by the end, of class period, I don't have to go and get everybody's slides from their files, and I don't have to do any of these things. We've got a presentation that I just pushed published, and I put it on our website, and now automatically we have a California history project that anybody can see, even outside of our classroom walls. So we do this a lot of things. We do a region, regions project. We have these are all different um, collaborative projects. They're not necessarily the A to Z, but they're projects that the students have done using collaborative presentations. This was one that I just did last week with a group from North Dakota. I was in North Dakota doing a presentation and we did an A to Z on North Dakota. So what I'm saying is that you don't have to create this A to Z template because I already have it for you. And any time that you're in Google Docs in Google Drive, you can always go to create from template. And if you search for A to Z in the public template, you're gonna see that I have that for you. And so you just say use this template, it makes a copy and it puts it in yours. Now you can do it with your students. You don't have to make all those 27 slides, we know with the title, um, on that. So you can, you can get the A to Z template as a project that you can do right now. Now, when you're doing collaborative Google presentations, best practice is that one person needs to start the presentation and set up the slides. Because if I would say, let's go into the lab, I'll start a presentation, then you each make your own slide, blah, 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 it's chaos. So you want to make sure that I would go in and then I would also assign which student has which slide and then we would all be able to work on it at the exact same time and you actually get to watch things appear and you get to see people edit in real time. You get a little picture of the person in the corner that's editing that slide, that, that slide um, which is pretty amazing. Google Forms. How many of you have created a Google Form before? So Google Forms are a way for you to collect information. And so any kind of data collection that you want to do in your classroom, whether it's you want to do a pre-survey um, in the fall when the kids come back on just like an interest survey. Maybe you want to get the parents, you know, contact information, their hopes and dreams for their student, and how their student is going to get to school in the morning. Maybe you want to have an entry or an exit ticket for students as they're walking into the class or leaving the class. You can create Google Forms that collect any kind of information. You create the form and Google automatically, thank you, creates a spreadsheet for you and collects all the information. So there's really only one thing that you do and it just starts collecting the information over and over again. If you haven't done Google Forms before, you should definitely get a session that talks about how to do Google Forms. There are specific sessions this week or this within the next two days directly about Google Forms. But, okay, so if you're not going to do a parent survey or reading inventories um, survey, you know, Google Docs project. Oh, the second grade weather and Google Docs project. So this was fun. I used to teach fifth grade, and we always had to do, like, data probability and uh, validity of data. So, of course, in fifth grade, what did we do? We flipped a coin. We collected the tally marks of that, and then we talked about the percentage, and then we talked about, gosh, how much data do we have? Do we have enough to make a decision that, say, gosh, when somebody flips a coin, it's about 49% or something? And we said, how could we make our data more valid? And they said, well, let's ask more people. 
So we created a Google form, and we put on there, what's your name? Can you flip a coin for us and let us know if you've got heads or tails? And just let us know what state you live in. So each of the kids' assignment was to come in with an email address of somebody that we could email this form to that we thought would maybe flip the coin. So we sent it out to a bunch of people, and that was really fun. And I thought, gosh, you know, I have a lot of people that would probably do this on my Twitter account and my Google Plus account and on my Facebook page. So I posted the link in all three places. In less than a week, we had people from five continents that had flipped a coin. We had to add country code and currency to our Google form so that we could start. The kids would come in early from recess to look at our form. And they would sit there and they would just watch. <laughs> wait for to see if we would get another answer on our Google form. So by flipping a coin, we had an internationally collaborative project that the students were a part of with us creating a form. Same thing happened with the second grade weather project. The kids talk a lot about the weather and they chart the graph, they graph and chart temperature and things like that, which we had a big swing in temperature in, in uh, Minnesota, that's for sure. It was like 116 the other day with heat index and then, you know, I've been there when it's like 40 below. So, you know, we've got some weather. Um, so anyways, we did the same thing with that. We put it out on Twitter and Facebook and things like that. The kids were glued to it. There's a really cool gadget within Google Spreadsheets that will automatically make a map for you of all the zip codes and country codes. And all of a sudden it looks exactly like those little Google Maps with the pop-ups. I'll show you how to do it sometime if you want to. YouTube homework. So another friend of mine, how many of you have heard of flipping the classroom? A little bit about flipping the classroom. So using Google, and actually there's somebody here that's doing it. I'm not sure if she's talking right now, so you may have missed it. Sorry, but you can look back at her resources. She's talking about how to flip the classroom at Google. But this is a really great way. So using Google Sites, you can embed a YouTube video on one side of the Google site, a Google form on the other side. The kids have to watch the video, whether you made it or didn't make it, answer a few questions on a Google form at night. You walk in on the morning, you check your little spreadsheet of all the answers that have been collected. You see, oh wow, we really need to review that question, but these three kids don't need to, so I'm gonna actually set them up doing this project instead. So you get real-time data at night. So we call that YouTube homework. We think it's a little bit different than flipping the classroom because it's really, um, sometimes we just do it to um, pre-teach a concept. Sometimes we just do it for fun. Sometimes we do it on a really serious thing that we say, gosh, you're gonna need this information for what we're gonna be doing tomorrow. This is when Google Forms becomes sort of fun, okay, and interesting. Not that it wasn't fun before, but this is an example of a Google Form that um, one of my fourth grade teachers uses in the district, and she does her Google Forms for quizzes and tests. Because if you collect all your information on quiz for quizzes and tests using a Google Form, and you ask for the student's email address, you run this little script called Fluberoo, and if you don't know about it, there's specific sessions and the guy who created Fluberoo is here at the conference, gonna be presenting this. You run a little script, it grades the assignment for you, and emails the student their grades along with the answers if you want them in there or not, okay? So that's a way that you can start automating and really kind of get some efficiency built into your classroom using Google Forms. Oh, so this is what Fluberoo looks like when you get, um, you get all the student submissions and then it comes through. And it actually has conditional formatting within the spreadsheet that tells you if a student scored low, this must have been a very hard test, or as a teacher, if the overall student scored low, I know I need to review that question. So it has some conditional formatting in there that gives you a little instant feedback as well. Google Drawings, people don't use Google Drawings as much as some of the other apps within Google Drive. But it's really fascinating because it's collaborative and it's a place that you can do thinking maps and you can do Venn diagrams. This was an example of a vocabulary project that the kids were doing on salmons. And uh, this, cho this kid chose spawn and they had to find an illustration, synonyms, um, a non-definition and a definition of the word and they did it all in Google Drawings. And then guess what? Because everything in Google Docs and Google Drive is easy to publish, once they created something in that same sharing settings place, we go, oh, Let's make it public on the web. We post it on the teacher's website, and now all the students had one whole page of all the, the vocabulary words that were from that science notebook um, activity, and they could review that web page for their homework or for their test review or anything. So Google Drawings is a less known, less used, but highly useful and really cool um, 
one of the apps. This is a picture of the kids kind of collaborating, and what I love about this project, or what I love about this picture with the Chromebooks, is the fact that some people say that, you know, when you include technology and in the lesson, you're not doing face-to-face -face time, but what, how are our labs set up? <laughs> not face-to-face -face time. Look at this with the Chromebooks. They're on the floor, they're face-to-face, -face, they're all working on the same dock, They've got their books still for information because we still use those, but they're all collaborating on the same doc and there are little pods of all these kids working all over the classroom together in real time, face-to-face -face collaboration. This is what work looks like to me now. And this what, this is what maybe work looks like you do right now too. This is a picture of collaboration to me. Collaboration means that we are being efficient by working on some sort of device together on one document we're sitting face to face, we're talking about things, but we're getting work done at the exact same time. We don't have to leave a meeting to go then do the work. You're doing the work while you're at the meeting and in the, in the same room as the people that you're doing the work with. Google Sites. So this is one of my favorite projects that we do. In fourth grade, all of the um, students at our school district have to do, well in Minnesota, have to do a state research project. And what we used to do is we used to create these really cute trifold brochures and the trifold brochures would hang in the hallway and the kids would share all their research there. Well, we just sort of said, at what point, when was the last time that you called to get a brochure on the place that you were going to go travel to and visit? Anybody? Bueller? Crickets? Okay. Because we now go online. We have the web as a resource to go do that. So now the kids use Google Sites, which is the website creation program, and the kids create a website for their state research project. They do all the same research, they do all have to do all the same writing of the paragraphs, but now they have a digital environment in which they're sharing it, and the audience is so much greater because we publish these on a website so the parents and grandparents and other kids can see it around it. So here is Caroline's project, and I usually tap Caroline to come in and present with me, but this is much too short of a time to talk uh, with, about, with Caroline. But so we've got New York and agriculture, we've got the business and industry, we've got the land and climate, we've got all these different things, but we use also Google Maps. <coughs> Has anybody made a personal Google Map before where you can create your own? Well, the little fourth graders, what they did is they created a <coughs> Google Map of their state, and Caroline said, that the Adirondack Park is a great place for hiking and has a beautiful view of the mountains. So she put these place marks in her Google map and she put the images and the words in them that she thought somebody would want to know about if they were going to go visit the state. So we have this other one, I can't remember, one of these links is one of the images is broken. So here's the other one, Buffalo gets a ton of rain each year, that's its neighbor. So the students were able to create the map and then embed the map right on, a web, on the website, which to me seems pretty relevant to the ways that you would actually access information. The one other thing that they did was fun, so we were talking about Google Forms. Each of the kids created their own Google Form as a quiz for other students or people who visited their website to see if they learned anything from the state project that they, they just wrote about. So the very last class period, we had all the websites on the teacher's website, the kids went into the lab, they looked through all the other students' what, you know, state research websites, they took the tests, and then the students were able to come back in and see if anybody, you know, how they did on them. So that was a really fun thing, and the kids loved creating the Google Forms um, and asking, you know, real tricky questions. Just questions that were gonna stump everybody. We also use Google Sites as an e-portfolio, and we haven't gone into the big reflective process of what are you going to choose and how often are you going to reflect on that, which is really important in the e-portfolio process, in any portfolio process. But for us, this was sort of a last minute, like, hey, the kids have done a lot of really cool digital work this year. We should probably put it all together for them. So this now is Lucy's pro portfolio from all the work that she did in fourth grade this year on her Chromebooks. Well, not even, you know, just since March they had the Chromebooks. But she's got it all sort of organized with some of the navigation. She's sort of got all of her links to all of the things that she's done there. And now she knows that she has a digital presence that's not Facebook, right? That's not anything different but really a positive outlook on the things that she's been doing and the things that she's been learning. And she can share that digital footprint with anybody that she wants to because it's a Google site that's published for the world. Now what's really cool though too is that Google Apps for Education can be a really walled garden. You can choose so that the students only share this website within your domain. 
or maybe it's just with the teacher, just one person. So the sharing settings can be global, or the sharing settings can be just really, you know, confined into a walled garden. So depending on your age of your students, or depending on the project, or the privacy of the information that's in there, we also use Google Sites in my district for a school board dashboard, an administrator's dashboard, and we only, we only give access to those specific people that can see the information that's on there to those people because that's the, that's the way that we would like um, to present the information. Google Sites really helps you to get like a one-stop shop of place to access information. Here's a picture of the, um, of the another picture of the little, little fourth graders. The kids, they all brought in their own earbuds. They all had some time that they could do some digital learning in that in that space, some of that quiet cave reflection time yeah, where they get to have some time just to themselves, um, which was really fun within the classroom. Video in the classroom is one of my more favorite topics that I like talking about um, right now. And when you talk about video in the classroom, there are so many different kind of lenses that you can see video in the classroom. Obviously, there are ways that you can just access all of the video that people have already made for you, okay? And so when you're thinking about a classroom in the cloud, video should be part of your equation within that. So what I talked about with the YouTube homework, with having the video in the Google form in there so that the students are interacting with video in that way. Creating playlists. If you don't have a YouTube channel and haven't started creating playlists, you should probably go to Arthur's session and James's session that's coming up that they're gonna be talking about YouTube in the classroom. Arthur, wave your hand over there. He's YouTube guy at Google, so he'd be a great session to go to. But what they are doing is they have an intention of creating playlists specifically for educators. So they want YouTube to not be that thing that your school district blocks, but that thing that's the most valuable free resource for you and your school. And so there, there's great content out there, fabulous content. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to create some playlists so that when you're studying magnetism and electricity, you go to the magnetism and, magnetism and electricity playlist and you've got absolutely fabulous content and video that your students can experience and use in the classroom and you know that it's quality, um, good educational things. You yourself can start creating playlists and should be creating playlists. You should have sort of that like funny category, but then you should also have your sort of American Revolution category and you should have your um, you know, famous um, historians or you should have lots of different playlists that you can start putting videos into folders that you can always go back to. Okay, so definitely do that. And then videos for assessment. Screencasting is becoming something that a lot of teachers are doing. But I just had this teacher that she said, I'm gonna give my kids a real world learning experience. If they can find the answer to the questions that I have on my test in 15 seconds on the computer, I should not be asking that question. I should be asking big world world problem. So she was doing a project on earthquakes and the students knew that the test was gonna be an open internet, open book test. And what was gonna happen is the kids were gonna walk in the door, they were gonna be assigned to a crisis team and she was gonna present the problem that there had been an earthquake. The kids didn't know what kind, they didn't know how severe, they didn't know where it was gonna be, but their task was to come up with some sort of creative crisis solution slash information for like the news, then also the information about what kind of earthquake it was, how do you know that it was that kind of earthquake, how, you know, how strong do you think it was? So one of the groups of students, they did a screencast as a news report kind of thing for the way that they were gonna share their information, and one of the students, let me borrow your one of the students was you know, sitting there talking to the, the webcam and she said, well, I know it wasn't the P waves because the P waves go like this. <laughs> I think it was the F waves because it was going like this and she was shaking the computer so that we were getting the experience <laughs> of what types of earthquake waves there were that were coming. It was so fun and funny. So videos for assessment are definitely, in all of the grad classes that I teach, I no longer write these long emails, I don't print anything out or whatever. I open up all the stuff, the digital work that they've had I create a screencast, and if you don't know about screencasting, check out the TechSmith out there. Jing um, is one of the programs that they use. There are some ways that you can do screencasting on the Chromebooks, um, lots of different ways that you can record video on the screen, but that's what I do now. I sit there and I talk to the computer, and I show them different resources, and I point out different parts in their problem, and then I send them a YouTube video that's private as their assessment and their feedback on their assessment. So we should be doing that, students should be doing that, video is definitely something. 
When you talk about editing video, so now we're at a whole other place. The students are creating, okay? They are creating video. We Video was one that we really had some fun with. And I talked with the guys uh, at We Video at ISTE, and they were really excited about the ways that they're kind of working with education. But We Video is now integrated within Google Drive. Okay? And there are a couple other video editors that you can upload all of your movies, all of your footage, into Google Drive, because Google Drive is really now a digital storage space. It's not just for docs and presentations and spreadsheets and things, but it's for videos and smart notebook files and Promethean flip charts and you know movies and songs and all those sorts of things, pictures. And then you can use WeVideo. So all the students, the little fourth graders on their Chromebooks, they created book commercials um, using WeVideo for each of the um, books that they had just read. And then Animoto. Has anybody used Animoto? It's not a Google Apps for Education project, but it is a great, fabulous site. So we used it for vocabulary study. And so when I was talking about those Google drawings with the spawn, you know how they did the, the four things? Well, now the kids had to find stock video, which they have in Animoto, stock video that would share the meaning of the word in images with the rest of their classmates. So the project was for somebody to be watching all the images go across and be able to start thinking about what is the vocabulary word that this person is trying to get across. And in the very end of Animoto, there was one slide that had the vocabulary word on it, and then another slide that had the meaning of um, the word on it as well. So it helped really form some images, music, they had to choose music that they thought was appropriate with that vocabulary word and definition as well. So using things like Animoto. Screencasting, again, some of the resources, if you haven't, um, for video in the classroom, done any of the Khan Academy, they have a lot of videos that are specific to math. You can have students go through self-paced. You can be their coach and get feedback on the progress that they're doing. It's fabulous. Sophia is sort of similar. It's, kind of, it's about social teaching, and it is um, about creating learning packets that have screencasts and presentations and images and worksheets and things like that. So Sophia is great. And then these a lot are different types of um, um, things that you can use to screencast. Not all of them uh, work on the, on the Chromebook because some of them are downloaded. Ecademy. Ecademy is a project that we have started um, in my district because we love the Khan Academy and a lot of teachers use it for specific parts of their um, resources, but we thought, wouldn't it be really cool if Edina teachers created some sim somewhat similar resource and we, we taught with the curriculum that we taught and we use the words that we use in ours. So we just, last year I had um, about 42 teachers create 275 videos for the Academy, um, ranging from kindergarten all the way through 12th grade, and I did not care if somebody had the same topic, because if a kid came in and said, oh, well, I've never had Mrs. Dunning for a teacher, I'm gonna watch Mrs. Dunning's lattice multiplication. Oh, now I get it. There are different ways that we, we um, can share it. So video in the classroom should be part of your classroom in the cloud, and there are so many different ways that you can use video in your classroom. Prezi is another one that's now, um, there is a Prezi app in the Chrome Web Store so that you can have it as a new, one of the, the parts of your new tab page. Um, but Prezi is something that we use a lot. This was a Causes of the American Revolution Prezi in which the students had to um, share the causes. And so you could see that this is, uh, this is the big picture. If you haven't used Prezi, what it does is it zooms in and out. It's not a first slide, second slide, third slide, but it sort of zooms in and out and you can really do a lot of really fun ways of the presentation. If you, get, if you have severe seasickness, <laughs> you gotta talk to the third graders about that because they are gonna go all over the place. It's very funny. But it's such a great um, conversation about design and presentations as well. So these are some of the examples of apps that you can now start adding to the new start tab page on Google Chrome, or if you have a Chromebook, and if you sort of scroll down to the very bottom here, there's a little Rubik's Cube-like look, and there's a little Rubik's Cube, and that's where all of your apps will start popping up. So Google, um, in education, has a serious commitment to working with a lot of the vendors that you know, like BrainPop and some of the other um, you know, Evernote. Um, they are working specifically with people. They pick up the phone and they call them, and they say, we want to make your product work with Google Chrome. We want to make it work so it's in the Chrome Web Store so that teachers can be using the web as their platform and they can access and use the work that you do. Some of the apps on Chrome are little just bookmarks that take you to their website. Okay? Some of them have more integrated and embedded productivity and efficiency within the app itself. So it will launch something that you can work. So um, this Pixlar-O-Matic 
If you haven't, uh, anybody use Instagram? Instagram, okay. It's way, it's kind of like a Facebook or a Twitter except you share pictures. But everybody puts on these like really cool, like old fashioned looking pictures. So there's like all these effects that you can put on the pictures to make them look black and white or sepia or you know, just look like an old fashioned photo. Well, pixel automatic is something that you can do that on your Chromebook or when you're in Google Chrome. And if you haven't played with my new favorite app of the week that isn't up here, because I don't think I knew about it when I made this at ISTE a week ago, is um, the webcam toy. Has anybody played with webcam toy? Nicole is going to be doing a whole uh, demo slam on it at 4.30 this afternoon, so you should come and see. But if you've owned a Mac and a photo booth where you can like make funny pictures of yourself or do like in multicolors, you can do that for free on Chrome using webcam toy. You can make yourself underwater, you can be at the disco, it's super fun. You'll probably ignore the rest of my presentation and play with it, actually. Um, the other one that I really like, too, is that is um, PicMonkey. And PicMonkey is not totally Google yet, and I'm not quite sure, but it used to be the Googlers that did Picnic. Did anybody love Picnic and get really, really sad when it went away? <laughs> I myself did. But then I realized PicMonkey. So PicMonkey is also an app that you can put within, um, within there. What's really cool too, and what I said with the Chromebooks and the Chromebook management, is that you can decide that you want specific apps to show up when, when students log into the Chromebooks. And so that's a really fun thing to go through and actually find some really good productivity apps that you can load onto your Chromebook in that management feature um, of that as well. So lots of fun um, web apps there. What I have on our website that I have for you here Okay, is this is my presentation that I have all the links to all the different resources and things like that. But I also have some links up here um, on the top that give you more specific examples of some of the things that we've been using. So you can actually click on, let's see, the um, Google Maps. I, didn't, I only showed one project of a Google Map project that we were doing. But a couple of the other ones that we do are, um, one of them is called The Amazing Race. And so the students um, plan out a tour around the United States or around their region that they're studying. And they make a, a custom map of telling you each of the things that they're doing along the way on the amazing race. Google Maps can also be collaborative. So you can have a group project on working on different maps. Another really fun thing, and I was talking to a teacher about this, um, I don't know, this week sometime. I don't even know what day it is today. But, um, is a, a kind of a global postcard project using Google Maps. So imagine creating one, and somebody did this, creating one Google Map, launching the link, saying, hey, could you create a postcard of where you're from that may, create an that may say an image, tell us what the temperature is today, and make a bubble right, on this map of where you're from and what it's like today in a picture of something that you, describe, that you think describes your region. And then if you tweet that out or share it intentionally with other people in education that you know would collaborate with you, you could have a whole Google map of different postcards that you could click on to learn about the region or what it's like to live in some other part of the country. So these Google, these Google maps can be very, very, um, they, they can be collaborative and really encourage sort of some learning outside the classroom wall. This one, did somebody have a question? Huh? Okay. Um, this is what was uh, one of my teachers did too for the Google Maps project. He's, he was saying, he's like, I just sort of want this to be an extension part of something that I'm doing. So I'm just going to create screencasts, which we were talking about where you record yourself in the video. Um, I'm going to create screencasts of each of the different ways that the students, you know, the how-to of this. So I've included those for you. So if you don't know how to create your own My Personalized Google Map, now you have all the screencasts and you can watch Wally tell you how to do it, as if you were a third, fourth, or fifth grader, because that's what he teaches multi-age. Um, so I have some other digital storytelling um, apps and examples of, for a classroom in the cloud. These are ones that um, my teachers love to use. Blabberize. Has anybody used Blabberize before? I keep talking to the people because the, the video that's on the, on the front, the llama, is sort of inappropriate. I email them like once a week, I think. But Blabberize is a really fun Let's do the Minnesota history worker. So the students go on, we are subscribers to um, United Streaming, so Discovery Education, and we, let's see if it'll load. Um, we can grab all their images. The cloud research project is kind of good too. This is the second grader. Let's see if any of these guys will load. Let me just give it a, 
a second. But what it is is it's a, you, you load an image and then you create a talking mouth. And so then the mouth can talk. So like the Minnesota History Project was a lumberjack worker and they just cut out a little part of the mouth and then the kid recorded their voice and it looks like the lumberjack is talking. This specifically is a cumulonimbus cloud. Oh, now we're loading. And um, it's a little second grader, so we push play. No, you can't hear it. But anyway, so that's his little cloud. So he's talking about himself being a cumulonimbus cloud, which is really cute. So, so those one, um, the, yeah, the fourth grade in Minnesota is actually the lumberjack. I think the other, I can't remember what the other Minnesota history one was. But um, so that's a really fun project, that you, a really good website that you can use in the cloud with your classroom. Um, I'm sure that you've probably heard of VoiceThread at this point. We're still loading. Um, that's another one of the digital storytelling apps. And then um, we've really had fun with GoAnimate. <coughs> Have you done GoAnimate before? Let me just see if I can bring up one of this one because it makes me look giggle every single time. It's a little fourth grader. But they were doing figurative language. Um, with GoAnimate. So GoAnimate is a site that you can go to and you can create like cartoon characters um, that talk and so it's like a little digital movie um, of that which is really fun. A um, couple other videos, so Blue Screen, Animoto. Um, has anybody used Wordle before? Wordle is a place, so what we do with Wordle a lot of the times is um, either the students have a Google form that's open and they, whether it's read aloud and they're doing nouns. <laughs> or whether it's um, we're doing Martin Luther King stuff and they're talking about important words that are coming from his speech. So they have that open and then at the end of the time all the words are submitted on the form. It's a great way to collect words that then you can turn into a Wordle. So using Google Forms to then do that. And then we actually had the kids print them out on black and white, um, big print, um, and then the students colored the words, mm, um, and then we put them up in the hallway as just sort of like what you know how they. And so it was this really cool um, picture of what they thought of the um, Martin Luther King speech. So let's see if I can get going. It, it's uh, it's loading right now. Um, I have on this classroom in the cloud website a link to a bunch of internet safety sites. Um, let's just see if I can. I don't know. Are we losing the internet right now, or is it just that one taking a long time? Many of us streaming. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's what? Yeah. Many of us streaming. Oh yeah, so many of you are trying to do blab blabberize right now. <laughs> yeah. With the organizations that you work with, have you noticed an increased need to really think about bandwidth? You know, not so much bandwidth, at least in our district. Access points, yes. So the kids were really cute with their Chromebooks because we they didn't really totally know where the access point was when they first got them. Um, and so you would just see the kids sort of walking around the classroom like this. <laughs> and now they have an access point within their classroom and for some magical region, reason they think they go up and you literally watch them and they just do it without looking and they just are like, they tap it. <laughs> and they think that's like how it connects or something like that. It's very funny. But um, we definitely found that we did um, heat maps of every single, next year we're ordering 250 more Chromebooks that are going to be delivered I think tomorrow, so um, that huge wireless. And so you have to obviously monitor your bandwidth, but it wasn't, we have bring your own device and we have a gazillion you know, things on ours, so we weren't as worried about that as we were about just you know, where the kids were going to access them. So um, let's see, I think it's Suzanne who's really funny. This is the Go Animate. Um, try to get the internet safety up too. So internet safety, and actually Google has done such a fabulous job of sort of partnering with a lot of different organizations to help you have a lot of resources to talk about internet safety. So they have the Google Family Center, which all parents should know about. Um, playing, and playing, and <coughs> playing and staying safe online. These are all different videos that you can watch. Um, I have a gazillion other ones, but the Think Before You is a really cool site that you should walk a lot of the kids and you should give this resource to the parents because it's, it sort of plays out this family and it has different situations in which they may encounter and so it gives you not a chance to role play but a chance to sort of role play along. So they're a bit of a cheesy family but it, you know you just kind of make a little fun of it and then it, it, it really helps teach a lot of the things. It's not a one-time conversation. You don't have an internet safety unit. It is absolutely embedded in everything that you do when you're on the cloud. 
because we need to teach the kids as we did Jamie I had to pop in and out of the thing did he talk about cars and banning cars this morning mm -hmm. yeah about how we didn't you know we're not going to ban the internet because the, there's there might be something dangerous out there we're going to teach the kids to look both ways and we're going to ask them to use it wisely um, so that they you know they can use it produ um, productively as well so oh that's not fun. Okay, give me one more second and then we're going to be done let's do Reagan this so this is Go Animate. about it uses a couple examples of it so um, you know we are ready the kids are ready they have so much fun they teach us things about um, about the cloud when we use the cloud with them so it is my encouragement for you to get your head in the cloud so that your students then can be in the clouds 